All right, so I, I said I, the beginning of the quarter, I said I wouldn't do this too much. So this will be the last time I try to tell you what I think you ought to be doing. And I guess it's what I said before, basically. What, what would we like you to learn in this class? And what we would like you to learn is, is a few ways that, that people have of thinking about the world. Um, Learn them well enough that you use them standardly to think about the world. <laughs> Not just in science classes, it actually comes up in a lot of different situations. So, so, so this is, this is our, our main goal here. But, but along with that, I mean the only way this can happen is if you have patience and, and I'll say courage and I'll talk about what I mean about that in a second. But, but the patience to, to take something that's complicated and, and try to make sense of it in terms of things that might be less complicated. Sometimes the complications are important and sometimes you can learn a lot about something by trying to think about it in a simpler way. And that's what these models are for. They are simpler ways of, of thinking about situations. Um, we, we, in a sense, we don't the, the complicated way, we don't have to worry about because it's here. Here's the, comp the complicated model of the world. I, I see it right out in front of you, me right now. And, and if we want to make any more sense of that, then we, need more, then we need simpler pictures of what's going on. And why do I say courage? Well, part of it is because in Discussion Lab, you are talking to people about things that you don't completely understand. Well, that's not easy. That, that, of course, is what science is. There are many things we don't completely understand. We talk about them anyway um, in an attempt to understand them, make better sense of them. Um, so it, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of nerve to talk about something that that you don't understand well in order to understand it better and so the, uh, that kind of thing in discussion lab is, is something that I certainly recognize and if, and if I'm teaching a discussion lab I mean the people who deserve the high passes in my class are the ones who are doing the best job in discussion lab in a general sense but where people really shine is when they are willing to ask questions that everybody or almost everybody else cares about. Maybe a few people think they know how to answer that question and so they will try to answer that question but somebody has to ask it. And, and so those of you who are asking questions out loud in class have uh, a lot of guts and are helping everybody else. Uh, what not to learn? The answers. You know, what, what's the answer to the quiz number two? Who cares? I don't care what the answer to quiz number two is. I don't care how much uh, ice I need to put into my coffee so that the ice melts just exactly in the coffee is cold. Um, all I need is a little bit more than that. I can already figure that out by experience. And these calculations are not because any of the answers mean very much. It's the process that counts. Can you uh, uh, think about the world in ways that give you, that give you a, a, a plan to calculate something or to explain something that you didn't already understand or you didn't already know how to calculate? So the process, analyzing problems and using these few ways of, that we have of analyzing problems is the thing that we would like you to learn and, and not, uh, I mean, how you do it step by step, how this one goes, what happens here in this step. I mean, I, I, want, you to, <laughs> I want you to be able to do algebra and, and use a calculator, but, but those are not where the grade is going to come. The grade is going to come in the, in the analyzing of problems. Basically. So uh, don't try to memorize a bunch of stuff. Uh, think and ask questions about all of these things. Eventually, this, these analysis skills just, just become how you think about the world. 
that everything comes up and, and you always have a way of, of analyzing the things that are going on in a, in a deeper way than you, than you would have just by knowing the answer. All right, so that's the last lecturing that I'm going to do on, on how to do well in this class. Maybe I'll say once again that people ask me how to do well on quizzes and my answer is always work with other people in a group, take practice quizzes and practice problems and uh, divide them up amongst members of the group and each member of the group work on it and then present their answers to the rest of the group so that each of you has a chance to get your discussions of how the world works uh, critiqued by your peers because they will. They'll say, why did you put that down there? I don't understand. And then you'll have to figure it out. And maybe you did it from intuition. And well, that's not good enough. You'll <laughs> you have to have a real scientific reason for why you did it. So their questions can, can help you think it through also. So working in groups uh, is, a, is a really good idea. I don't know if you know this, but, but scientists tend to go to, uh, go to conferences where they talk to other scientists about what everybody's working on and when you come home from that your, your mind is just full of tons of things that you've learned and, and are about to try to make sense of. So uh, working with other people is the best thing that you can do. At least it's a tried and true method. Well, this is just a, a rundown on, on where we're sitting right now. Today we're going to talk basically about potential energies. Might get a chance to take one step beyond that. Um, potential energies sit right over here. This is uh, just a sum of a whole bunch of changes of energy. We've always written delta E total is equal to energy transfers. But once you've chosen a physical system, the total energy of that physical system is over changes in the total energy over here on the left. All sorts of things about that physical system could be changing around. If the energies change, the total energy changes, then it can only change because of energy transfers. The energy transfers we use are heat and work. Those are the only two we have. Heat is an energy transfer. It's one you know a lot about. It's an energy transfer from something hot to something cold. This table is colder than my hand. Something at a high temperature to something at a lower temperature. The sun transfers heat to me because I am not sitting here at 10,000 degrees. If I was sitting here at 10,000 degrees, then the, I wouldn't get warmed up by the sun. W, work, energy transfer, basically it's everything other than heat. We'll only use it in a, in a narrow sense of, of a force applied to something and acting through a distance. I'm sure all of you have done that in DL. If I take this and push down on it and push through a distance, then I add energy to it. The other ones you know something about and we'll talk about more either at the end of the day today or, uh, or next week. Right now I want to talk about, I want to say a little bit more about work because work requires a force. Force is a, is a way to describe interactions. There's no force sitting there by itself. It's always force of something on something. It always involves two objects. I put a force on this tennis ball. Right now I'm pushing it straight up. I can tell I'm pushing it straight up. Uh, well. It's really easy to push this tennis ball straight up. If it were a bowling ball, I would really know that I was pushing straight up really hard uh, because it would be hard to hold up. Um, with a tennis ball, I hardly even notice it. 
But a force is, is one of the ways we, we use to describe interactions between things. And I have always been calling potential energies interaction energies. So, so somehow potential energies have to be related to forces because they're both describing interactions. The force is what you would use to describe the interaction as it happens. And changes in energy, potential energy, is how you describe the interaction before and after something has changed. So heat we already know about. And work is the one I want to spend just a little bit more time on. Um, all right, I think something's missing here, but I'll just write it all down. Uh, oh, no, it isn't. It's okay. Uh, work is, is done by a force. Uh, and, and I've already said this, but I'll say it again. Not just a force that's, I mean, I'm pushing up on this thing right now, but I'm not adding energy to it. The energy of this thing isn't changing. But if I put that force on and push it through a distance, so this object moves a distance while I'm pushing on it, then I've added energy to it. I've done work on it. If I push a ball, <laughs> My, my left hand here is pushing that ball toward the right. The ball isn't moving right now, and so I'm not adding energy to it. But if I take my right hand away, the ball will move. When the ball moves while I'm pushing on it, I'm adding energy to it. So work is the force on something times the distance that it's moved while that force is on it. So when you're just holding the ball still, you're not doing any work, but is the energy you're burning going into heat then? Because you're, you're doing something, though. What? There is something moving when I'm just holding it like that. And, and it's, not, it's no good holding something light. So let me hold something a little bit heavier. If I hold something heavier, you, you can tell that you're, doing, that you're using energy. And yet the energy of this thing is not changing. So what's going on and what's moving and what's going on and what's moving is a whole lot of little molecules in your, in your muscles and, and they, they use energy to walk along uh, other little strands uh, in your muscles. Uh, but then they relax and while they're relaxing some other muscles are, are moving, some other molecules are moving along. So what's going on inside your muscles is a whole lot of action just to keep, a whole lot of stuff is going on inside just to keep that thing in that position. So there's a lot of energy being used because uh, muscles are tensing up and relaxing and tensing up and relaxing little muscle fibers just over and over and over again while I hold this thing even though I'm not moving it. And so I use energy and uh, most of it is just showing up as thermal energy. If I just hold this here, I'm just, if I hold something really heavy, I'll just get warmer and warmer. And, and eventually, uh, heat will flow from me into the room as it is, and my temperature will stop changing. But we're all, there, are other thing, there are other ways you have of dumping heat. But that's what's going on. There are, there are movements going on inside your muscles. It's just that there are more of them when you do that and transfer energy to this thing. So, force and the object has to move. Now, there's a little bit of a tricky thing here that, that I didn't say very much about, but I put two vertical lines. Force on A, and then I put two vertical lines, and that's just meant to be, to be a parallel sign. And what I mean by that is that the force has to be applied parallel to the motion. Okay, can I apply a force that isn't parallel to the motion? Well, let me give you an example. I'm applying a force straight up on this block in order to hold it up. But if I move along at a constant speed, then this block is moving along at a constant speed. I'm still applying a force upward. But if I could figure out, I can't really move along at a constant speed, but this is the best I can do. If I move along at a constant speed, its kinetic energy isn't changing. Its height isn't changing, so its gravitational potential energy isn't changing. So I'm applying a force, but I'm not doing any work on that block. I'm not adding energy to it. 
because the force is applied perpendicular to the motion. Delta x is this way. The motion is this way and the force is that way. And the force that you apply that ch adds energy has to be applied uh, has to be applied parallel to the motion. So if this thing is moving upward at a constant speed, so no kinetic energy change, but gravitational potential energy going up, it's because the force is applied along the motion. I can add energy to it if I apply the force in the right direction. Now you almost automatically think of the force being applied in the right direction. Almost automatically because why, if I want to throw the ball this way, I'm going to apply a force that way. I wouldn't apply a force straight up in order to throw it that way. That isn't my intention and that isn't what I normally do. So you can accidentally think that that's the only thing there is, is forces applied in the direction of motion. But in fact, it's, it's easy to figure out that there are forces applied that are in other than the direction of motion. If this is moving at a constant speed, then there's actually no force horizontal while it's moving at a constant speed. But there are vertical forces. They're just not changing the energy. <coughs> so that's a small technicality that, that is sometimes important. I think in 7C it's really important. And in 7B there's a time when it's fairly important. Uh, why does it matter that you're going at a constant speed if you're, um, if you're defining the interval at the beginning and end when you're stopped? Well, I wanted, it to, I wanted to pick an interval somewhere in the middle okay. while it was going at a constant speed. The reason I wanted to do that is if I, pick a, if I pick an interval here where it's not moving, and then, I, and then suddenly it's moving, then I can't say, oh, the energy didn't change. In fact, now it has kinetic energy and at the beginning it didn't. Right, and how did it suddenly stopped. have kinetic, pardon me? But then if you stopped at the end <coughs> also, then you... I could stop at the end, but I was trying to talk about it as I walked along. So you could pick an endpoint anywhere while I'm walking. But if I started at the beginning where it isn't moving, and then I've added kinetic energy because now it's moving, if I've added energy, you'd have to say I did work on it. And in fact, in order to get it to move that way, I had to move my hand. And because there's friction here between my hand and the block, I actually applied a friction force that way to get it moving. So to start it moving and to give it that initial kinetic energy, I, there was actually a friction force applied by my hand in that direction. If this thing had no friction, what if my hand was perfectly horizontal and I walked to the right and there was no friction, then my hand would do that and this would drop to the ground and I wouldn't have given it any kinetic energy. So I, I try to talk about not the beginning point and not the end point just because I would suddenly have to bring up the friction between my hand and this. So you're right. Uh, it's there. If, if, if you think of it, bring it up and we'll talk about it. But. <coughs> 